Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to our inaugural uh, Citizens Academy. And I'm Vincent Yu, Mayor of Temple City. And uh, joining me to welcome you tonight are, four, are three other council members. And I think uh, Cynthia may be here. Um, due to formalities, uh, we kind of we noticed this is a city council meeting, so just for formality's sake, I need to open up tonight's meeting. So the meeting's formally open as a special city council meeting. And uh, I guess we need a roll call. Here. Councilmember Blue. Council Member, Council Blue, Council Member Chavez, Here. Council Member Vizcarra, and myself. And uh, uh, Mayor for Town Sternquist not here yet uh, for, for cost. So, so anyways, uh, that's just formality. Let's put that away. And, and I really want to thank all of you for taking the time to come tonight. It is very encouraging to us to see the, the, the amount of uh, enthusiasm from you. I mean, because you, not only you're coming tonight, you're also committed to the next, uh, at least the next six sessions, all together seven sessions. And it's very encouraging to see that there's so much interest from you. It really, um, very confirming to us, uh, as somebody on the city council, and as well as to city staff that, that, that you're also interested. And hopefully, and one of the goal of the of the academy is not only to talk about what we do in the city, and hopefully it would um, generate more interest from you. And I'm sure we'll be seeing you uh, volunteering or joining our commission, and perhaps someday we might see all of you, or some of you at least, on the city council. Uh, there are some people I need to particularly point out tonight, though. I really want to thank. Um, our former mayor, uh, Tom Chavez, uh, it was his idea who brought the academy to the city. And he and uh, Council Member Bloom worked very, very hard along with city staff, uh, especially assistant to the city manager, Mr. Brian Hayworth, who will be our main presenter tonight, actually. I want to really thank them for working so hard to put this together. So, without much to do, I'm going to ask uh, Councilmember Bloom to come up. Thank you all. Okay, thank, you, thank you, Mayor. Uh, just get started. One, one of the side benefits, I think, of this academy is going to be for you people to get to know each other. And I'm sure a few of you know each other, but uh, you probably don't know very well. So we're going to start out with uh, some introductions here. Brian did a good job. Did you read this? This case, Adia? Okay. <laughs> I told Brian he had to lighten it up somehow and he said, ah, I got it. Uh, what we're going to do, we're going we're to go through here, we're going to ask you to, to come up one by one. We want to do this very quickly, minutes, maybe a minute each. Uh, just give us your name, where you live, and what I'm going to ask you to do is to take one of these tags, go over to the map here, and stick it about where you live. So we get a feel where everybody here lives. Are we all in one area or where are we scattered around? You may find out that there's a neighbor sitting in this room that you didn't know was your neighbor. And uh, so we'll go through that. And then uh, if you could just briefly tell us if you're currently involved with the city or have been involved with the city and anything like that. So I'll start out. I'm Carl Bloom. I live on Hart Avenue, which is about here. And I've been involved, I was on the Planning Commission for five years, and I've now been on the City Council for just a little over two years. Rita. Speak loud now so we can all hear. My name is Rita Padilla, and I also live on Hart Avenue. We're, made, we're neighbors, and um, I'm, I am vice chairman of the Tennessee Chamber of Commerce. Okay, next. Yeah, Brian said, don't waste too much time on this stuff. He says, get it done with, but I got a lot to cover. So. Well, my name is Gary Khalil. Uh, I live on Main Street. I have to find out where it is. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do a Broadway, Broadway, Broadway. Here's a uh, name. First name. I'm just an ordinary citizen. And I just want to learn more about what the city government is. But by the way, we're all just ordinary citizens. Okay. <laughs> Good. Thank you, 
John Fryno. I live on Broadway Avenue. And I'm recently involved with the CERT program, the Certified Emergency Response Team. My name is Cynthia Vance. <laughs> I live on Loma Avenue. And I was born in Temple City, so I've lived here a long time. Involved in the city at all? No. Okay. <coughs> you will. <laughs> now, I know the Vance Hall. I'm living in Alessandro Avenue. I'm also owner of Golden Carpet in Los Angeles. Where's Los Angeles? This is Los Angeles. Well, he's doing that. It's interesting, even being on the city council. You know, we have a lot of streets names in town every now and then, and somebody will say I'm on such and such a street, and I'll shake my head yes, and as soon as I leave, I'll go take my map out and say, okay, where is that street? Hi, uh, my name is Ben Torres. Um, I guess today marks the first day of me getting involved with the, with the city. Um, I live right off Broadway, and... My name is Jerry Jambazian, and I'm a business owner here in Temple City, 57 years, and just happy to be uh, learning more about the city. Is our city's uh, oh, wonder cleaners. He's the city's photographer. He knows more about the city than most of us on the council. No. <laughs> Jerry owns a business here in town, but Jerry lives just above the high school, right, just outside the city limits. Most people call me Sam, and I live on Olive Street, and I can't, oh, there it is. And this is my first time in the city. Okay, whoever's got the stickers are next. <laughs> what, what happened to the stickers over here? Oh, went back. Everybody's got them, okay. Uh, I'm Guy DeMarco. Uh, I live on Cloverly, and I uh, am not yet involved with the city and the city. Okay, next, whoever's next, come on up here. My name is Dora Hubbard. I live on Alessandro Avenue, and I'm involved with the, a lot of school activities, PTAs, and for jump school, and Sister City, the um, exchange program. Mm -hmm. Okay, next. I'm Steve Curran, and uh, I've lived in Temple City for about 40 years, but I have been involved, and this will be an opportunity for me to do that. I live on Roland Avenue, which is I'm a current member of uh, 
public safety volunteer program. Uh, not very active. Thank you. Was the house fire down near your street? Uh, no. Okay. I live on Freer Street. My name is Usama Nimri and I'm an active vice chairman for the Public Safety Commission. I'm Jane Chavez, and by marriage, I'm married to your previous mayor, Tom Chavez, so sometimes more than I want, I think I'm a little more active in the city than I want to be sometimes, but it's been good, and it's been an awesome experience, and it's a great city. We live on Freer Street. Congratulations to everybody. Uh, we are scattered around the city here a little bit, and uh, so if there's anybody in your neighborhood that you haven't met before, obviously you know they're, they're in the room here, so find them out. Uh, with that, just want to talk just briefly of why the academy. Uh, like it says here, what happens at City Hall probably affects you more than uh, what is performed in any other level of government. The federal government, the state government, the county government, uh, the reason cities exist is so that we're close to the citizens, we're close to stuff going on. So that's, that's what we do here. And uh, if you don't have to call Sacramento, you know where City Hall is, you can walk over here and you can talk to us. And uh, I don't think anybody that's a, elected here is more than, uh, it can't be more than about two miles away from where you live. So that's where we are. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to, uh, oh, one more, I've got to go. We've got seven seven sessions. I'm going to talk about city government tonight. Uh, the second one will be on city's finances. Uh, it's a little more complicated than your checkbook. Uh, neighborhood services, uh, community planning, uh, public safety, parks and rec, and then economic development, uh, things that we're looking at. We're looking for your input as part of this, so you know this isn't intended to be a class where you sit here and just say nothing all the time. So uh, Brian, I'm sure will, if you got some questions about something, raise your hand, ask the questions. Uh, if we don't have the answers, we may not have them all. Uh, we'll, we'll get you the answers. And, uh, so it should be very exciting. All, all the classes will not be here. I know some of the classes are gonna be, I think we're gonna have one down at the Live Oak Park. Uh, is one gonna be over to Sheriff Station? So we're, we're looking at moving them around so you get get a feel of where the, what, what's going on in the city here. And uh, the city doesn't own very much property. Uh, we own the Civic Center, we own this park, we own Live Oak Park, we own a maintenance yard over on the Encinita, and I think we own a couple of parking lots. And that's the extent of what we own here in the city. So a couple of the details, uh, we're four square miles, which really isn't very big. And uh, I share with people a lot of times, it's nice being on the city council because there's no event further than 10 minutes away. <laughs> I, mean, I, I worked for the county and there were times where you'd have a meeting in the Emerald Valley, a seven o'clock in the morning meeting where you had to be on the road by five o'clock. But this one you say, oh my gosh, we have a meeting at 7.30, it's 20 after I can make it. <laughs> uh, we have just over 35,000 residents in Temple City here. Uh, the median age of people living in Temple City at this point is 42 years old. Uh, we're predominantly Asian, we're 55% Asian according to the last census. Uh, the income, uh, average income for a household is close to $80,000, so we're a fairly well-to-do community. Uh, businesses, we have 913 and I believe about 300 of those are, are home-based businesses. And, uh, 
Brian will talk about this a little later, but we're a contract city, so we don't have a lot of staff ourselves. So we have about 35 permanent staffers. So if you do the math, 35 in there, so it's about 1,000 for each permanent staffer we have, they represent about 1,000 citizens here. So that's in a very quick nutshell what the city's all about. Brian? I think this is yours. Thank you very much. I, I was going to say, th this is Brian's first time doing this. First time for all of us to do this. So we're all saying, "Oh my gosh, what are we going to do? What are we going to say?" So be easy on Brian, <laughs> please. please. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, hi there. I am Brian Howarth. I'm the assistant to the city manager here at Temple City City Hall. And on behalf, again, of the council as well as city staff, we wanted to extend a warm welcome and a thank you for being part of our first academy. So tonight's session is about city government 101. Why the city does what it does, what are the laws, what are the structures in place that make us do what we want to do. And there's some method to our madness, so to speak. So what we developed tonight was the session based on seven questions we hear from community members like you. And so we have put these into some categories the first category being, what does City Hall do and how does it get its powers to be a city government? The second category is looking at who governs the city and how the city is administered, how we run day-to-day -day operations. And the last thing that we're hearing more and more from people is, why are you working with other governments? We have our own issues here in, city, in Temple City. What's the need? So we have answers all for those. So with that being said, um, we're gonna first start with, what does City Hall do? Where does City Hall get its powers to legislate? And under what model does City Hall operate? And by the way, there's a lot of models out there, so I'll try to differentiate them. Um, and this was actually a good learning experience for me because I didn't know some of this stuff. So uh, I think you'll find it in, uh, useful. So first of all, functions of City Hall, there's four major functions of City Hall. First of all, is to provide critical services. You walk in your neighborhood and you see a service or you see something, chances are City Hall's involved with it, whether it's you're paving the road, making sure that your trash is being picked up, that your street tree is trimmed, um, to making sure that your kids or your family members go to parks and can enjoy the parks and the programming, we're there. Um, we are also in the business to enact laws uh, to protect your local welfare. Of course, we can't be an anarchy city. We have to play by the rules of what the state allows, but there are things that we can do to make Temple City an even greater place to live. The third power we have is we can generate local revenue. And that means we can either take debt out, we can go take loans, we can impose taxes, we can impose fines, we can impose fees. Um, although I'm glad to say that we have one of the lowest property taxes in LA County and in uh, the San Gabriel Valley. And the last thing is we employ necessary personnel. This stuff just doesn't happen all by itself. We need a team to get the stuff done. Brian, Brian? Yes. If anybody has any questions, should we just pop their hand up and we'll take them? You know, actually, that's a great idea. Let's go ahead and do that. So, uh, legislative powers. The state constitution allows cities to be cities. Uh, has a provision in law in the Health and Safety Code that allows city governments to occur. And in 1960, I'm sorry, in 1960, uh, voters of the Temple City community voted to incorporate to create a city government here in Temple City. And the reason why they did that was because they wanted more local control over the types of services they received from the county, and they just wanted, there was a pride here in, in, in the community. When the city incorporated in 1960, and just like most other cities, there are two forms of service models that cities follow in California. One of them is to be a contract city, the other one is to be a full service city. And a contract city is a city where it contracts out most of its services. So here in Temple City, we contract out our public safety services, so the sheriff's department. We contract out some of our public works programs, street sweeping, trash. Uh, basically, the big ticket items, we contract out. And there's a reason why, because it's more cost efficient to do so. Um, let's talk a little bit about the full service city model. That's where you have all, the, all your um, operations under one roof at City Hall. So I'll give an example. Arcadia, that's considered a full-service city. Um, how we talked about how we have 35 employees, they have nearly 300 employees in Arcadia. And um, so yes, they do have all their services in City Hall. 
and there's pros and cons to that. But I will tell you, in a contract city, it's less money because, first of all, we don't have to pay the overhead costs for personnel. We don't have to pay the retirement costs. We don't have to pay for all the equipment. It's part of the contract. So it makes um, providing services much better. Um, the one con to that is that you do have less oversight. You're depending on service delivery from a contractor. So if they mess up, we get to hear from it, but we get to deal with it at the same time. A full service city, yes, it costs more money, but there's more oversight over what staff can do. And you can ask someone in, in Arcadia, there's pros and cons to being a full service city or a contract city. But right now, what we're seeing trend-wise in California is most cities are starting to become a contract city. Even though maybe it's not in their city charter or in their bylaws, they're looking to outsource services because it's much cheaper to do so. So um, the smart thing was when they incorporated, we became a contract city. And right now, it's actually working to our advantage because our city does not have labor agreements. It does that, you know, uh, depending on whether the economy is good or bad, we can ramp up the services, we can decrease the services without having to worry about um, you know, labor agreements, just general revenue, everything. So it actually really works well for us. So, so from 1921 to 1960, how did how did the city operate? I didn't have a city, so so right. It was it was a county incorporated area. So you see a lot of the little islands around here, so to speak, these little neighborhoods that are within county jurisdiction, that's what Temple City was at one time. So most cities, before their cities, they're generally under the control of the county. The controller of the county then runs it as a, the same equally to any of the, of the groups under the, under the controller. Right. Uh, so, like for instance, the other two cities I've worked for, one was Rancho Cordova, it, uh, incorporated seven years ago. And they actually incorporated because uh, they were tired of the low service level that Sacramento County was providing them. They wanted more oversight of the decisions being made there, and they also wanted better services for their community. And they said, we can do better than this, and they incorporated, and I think there they um, had a 90% voter turnout rate. Or, I'm sorry, approval rate. Dur during the major disaster that we had seven months ago, the windstorms, what are the pros and cons of being a charter city during something as disastrous as that? As a charter city? Yes. Okay. Well, you know, let's get into that next slide and right. uh, we'll answer that. So, um, oh, okay. I already hit it. Uh, so the next uh, model, so we talked about service models that cities operate, the, the two. And there's also two models of how cities are structured legislatively. And in 1960, the city incorporated as a general law city. So most cities are general law cities. About 75% of the cities in California are general law cities, and that means they abide by the rules of the state legislation under state statute. Where a charter city is much different because you have more municipal control over what types of laws you do. You can hold your own elections. Um, there's just much more autonomy. And in fact, the charter system is working really well for us because first of all, we have like this constitution that says how the city can work, how it doesn't work, who gets appointed. It's very clear on, on, on um, the charter. And the charter is very specific, where if you look at state statute, most cities don't like to be a general law city because they have to deal with the laws of the state that sometimes are very broad, and it doesn't give a whole lot of local control. And back in 1971, and it was cool to think that Temple Cityans were renegades at that time because they, they, they got away from the county, not to say the county's bad, but I'm saying they wanted more localized services in their community. And what they realized is at 11 years after incorporating, they said, you know what, we even want more oversight over our own affairs. And so they became a charter city where it gives them more autonomy to do what they want to do. For example, we hold our own elections. We don't, under, under a general law city, you have to go with what the county says where the elections are. If there is a huge issue that's affecting the city and we need to take a vote for it, we can do it without having to rely on the county timeline. The other thing that we're seeing right now is that um, a lot of cities, with the elimination of the redevelopment agency, they don't have economic development powers anymore. Redevelopment agencies provide a lot of funding to, to bring businesses in to pay for infrastructure. But because we're a charter city, we have the authority to legislate over our own municipal affairs. Economic development, bringing in businesses, that's a municipal affair, it affects the community. And so what we're able to do now, and we'll talk more about this in a subsequent section, is the charter allowed us to develop an economic development program where the only 
one of two cities that we know of the San Gabriel Valley that's now going to move forward with economic development because the charter allowed us to do that rather than if we were a general law city, we wouldn't have been able to do that. So a charter again is your city constitution. We do have a copy for you in your uh, binders. Uh, the charter structure again allows for home, home uh, rule provision. And um, the good thing and the bad thing, you've got a charter, but if you want to make any amendments to it, you have to go for a vote. And I'll tell you right now, elections are not cheap. They're about $70,000 every time we do. 70? 70, yes. So back to the question about charters. I don't know if that has any 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 bearing. I could be wrong. I don't know. I'm looking to my fellow staff members of, of how the charter system would help with windstorm response. But really, I think it comes more to intergovernmental affairs, which really helped us with windstorm response. And in fact, that's a point I'll be touching. So, um, just in about five minutes. Okay. So again, real quick, just to recap, the city. The service model is developed under a contract city. We contract out our services, uh, it provides more autonomy. And on that note of autonomy, we also operate under a city charter that gives us more self-control, or, or more self-power rather, um, to, to provide the services that the community wants. So the second topic or category that we're gonna talk about is who governs the city and how is the city administered? So, there is your city council, and you've met, uh, I believe, four of them tonight, and I know you'll be meeting Cynthia Sternquist very soon. The city council is the governing body, and in the charter, the charter explicitly states that the role of the city council is to set policy and direction. Those are their key responsibilities. Now, city council members, they're elected to office. Um, members have four-year terms, and they have eight-year term limits, so they can serve four consecutive terms, and then uh, there was a, or two, I'm sorry, two consecutive terms, thank you. And then uh, they have to, and then their, their terms are up, they can take two years off, and they rerun again. And in fact, that was an amendment to the charter in 1992. So Temple Cityans wanted to make sure that there was some, some type of a term limit set. Uh, member decisions are weighted equally. The mayor, the mayor pro tem, nobody has more voting power than the other. All their votes are the same. Uh, the mayor, mayor pro tem are annually appointed meaning that uh, the fellow city council members appoint a mayor and a mayor pro tem every year to serve in those capacities, and that's done every March through what we call a reorganization. And then finally, um, there's a lot of stuff coming in the city council's way, uh, and so they actually use city commissions to assist with policy recommendations. So the city right now has three city commissions. It has a planning commission, a public safety commission, and a parks and recreation commission and pretty soon a public art commission. We're getting public art here in the city. But um, right now each commission has five <coughs> members, so we basically have 15 commissioners in the city, and members serve for two year terms. And just real quick as a side note, we have six openings on these commissions, and we really encourage you to um, apply. There's two openings on the city's planning commission, there's two openings on the city's, actually there's two openings on each one of these commissions. So um, if you're interested in applying, please let Peggy Quo know. She's our acting city clerk and she'll uh, get you set up with an application. But going back to the city commission, um, commissions do have some quasi-judicial powers, meaning they do have authorities. And under state law, planning commissions can't approve development, whether it's a, something as simple as your room add-on to something that's being proposed big time, like the gateway project at Las Tunas and Rosemead. So they do have a lot of authority in way of planning reviews. Um, the Public Safety and the Parks and Recreation Commission also have uh, quasi-judicial or approval powers and that's set forth in the Municipal Code, which is basically the laws of the city. And how you would ever come up to them is if you got a parking ticket and you wanted to get it appealed, you go to the uh, Public Safety Commission. And if you wanted to maybe host a big event in the park, or if you wanted to bring new types of programming, you would go to the Parks and Recreation Commission. So it's a very active commission, and they really do bring a lot of policy recommendations back to the City Council uh, to move forward. So this is kind of a governance cheat sheet. Uh, I kind of look at governance as like a three-legged stool. And obviously the community's in the seat, the driver's seat. And really what it comes down to is maybe the community recommends policy. But it's or, or drives the policy, however you want to look at the verb. But basically, you're telling City Hall, this is what we want. 
City Council, they'll set the policy based on what they hear from you. The Commission sometimes recommend policy. It could be something like where the community just wants to we'll throw out like a broad objective. Like, I wanna see more houses in Temple City. Well, the commission would look to see, well, how are some ways to do that, for instance? And then administration, which is where I work, and city staff work, how do we implement that policy? And I don't like saying policy because it makes me sound like a bureaucrat, so think of policy like programs and activities. That's probably a better way of thinking about it. <coughs> okay, so we talked about um, two types of structures already. The city's a contract city. The city is also a uh, contract city and charter city. And at that point, I'm gonna open it up for questions because I realize I'm starting to So if you have any questions, feel free to please ask. Yes, sir. Regarding a vacancy on the council, is it the council's prerogative that they can appoint a somebody that maybe hasn't been off the council for two years in between? I'm sorry, so there's an appointment on the city council. Can they just appoint anybody? Well, that let's say a former reason? council person has not waited the full two years. Can they appoint somebody to fill in a remaining term? You know, I don't know. Actually, we're all, I don't know that question. question. Uh, I can get back to you on it. Okay. My thinking, and I'm just, I'm very black and white. I would say no, but I don't want to give the wrong answer. But what we'll do is we'll create an email. Um, or some type of a website where we have all those answers and we'll get those for you. So again, we've already, I'm sorry, any other questions? What is the like, mayor is selected by both of them by council members? I'm sorry? And the mayor is selected by two Oh, actually, we're going to hit this next, actually, right now. So uh, we're just going to start this um, slide now. So we've already talked about the two structures that already exist, Charter City and Contract City. And I promise this is the third structure that we're going through. And so there's two models out there that cities operate under. One of them is called the Mayor Council Form of Government and the Council Manager Form of Government. And in fact, the Mayor Council of Government is where the mayor is elected by voters. The mayor has a lot of say-so on, on how to run city hall. So they can hire and fire department heads, um, they get really their hands dirty in the day-to-day -day operations. Uh, this is a structure that's more typical in larger cities, so Los Angeles. That's what you would see as a mayor uh, council form of government. The council manager form Sometimes of government. Sometimes that's called a strong mayor system. Correct, exactly. Um, the council manager uh, system is really the most common system that you see out in those cities. Actually, it's about 75% of cities operate under this model. And one thing that's just kind of interesting to note is, is those cities that operate under the mayor council um, system, they actually want to become council manager systems because they want to take the politics out of day-to-day -day administration. Uh, but, you know, it's a huge process, but uh, it is what it is. But going to the council manager form of government, the mayor's role is more ceremonial. Um, really, it's the city manager uh, that has the administrative authority to really drive and implement the policy to hire and fire department heads, to really just have their finger on the pulse of what's going on. And uh, TC, or Temple City, we operate under this common structure. So again, 75% of governments in city governments operate under the council manager form of government. So under the city charter and under the council form of government, um, the city council um, appoints two people to essentially run the city. And um, they appoint both the city attorney and the city manager. And both of these positions have equal fitting, so no one trumps the other, it's both equal. And uh, the city attorney deals with more of the legal day-to-day -day issues, um, everything from you know, defending the city in court to looking at new laws, resolutions, contracts. This is everything a typical mayor, or I'm sorry, uh, a lawyer would do. Um, because we are a contract city, we do outsource our services to Burke Williams and Sorensen. Um, our city attorney is Eric Bill, which if you've been to a council meeting, you've seen him. And the beauty about outsourcing our services to a large firm is that we can cast a larger net out to the services we need, whether we need personnel law issue, uh, help, if we need um, construction law help, there's much more flexibility and much more um, room uh, to address legal issues. On the other side, this is my boss, Jose Polito. He's our city manager, and he really is kind of like the captain of the ship, so to speak. Um, he manages operations, he drives the implementation, um, he appoints uh, department heads, and he directs department activities. So he is, if you think about it, 
in the business world. He's like the CEO of the city. Could we have the captain stand up for us? Yes. <laughs> That's a great analogy because, uh, like, in the corporate city council, the, the equivalent would be the board of directors. Yep, exactly. And that's a CEO. Well, we kind of also think you guys are like the travel agents because you're setting the chart for where we want to go. So we, we thought about it like that, too. So this is the city organization. We simplified it. Uh, basically, you have the city council at the top and then the city attorney assisting the city council. And we'll talk more, but basically, Mr. Polito is here in management services. Mm -hmm. Um, so really, when you're looking at the city organization, we have four departments. So city departments, management services, what do we do? We do a lot, but I'm only limited to six bullets, so I'll make it quick. Um, we provide the organizational leadership. We're, we're, we're making sure that things are getting done. Um, we're directing and planning the day-to-day -day operations. What needs to get done? What, what projects does, do the council want to bring up to the city council agenda? Uh, what's going on with constituent needs? Um, how, how we have a work plan that has 80 items that need to get done in the next year. Are we reporting that out to the city council? Um, you know, it's just a lot of work. We also are taking a huge focus uh, now, which a lot of cities disregard, and that's really economic development and communications. And it's probably more important than ever that cities need to start looking at this. We do have an engaged citizen. We have you here, and we have a lot of people wanting to know what's going on. In fact, you're going to see good changes happening in the community, and so from a communication standpoint, we need to relay this information to you. Here's what's going on with the Gateway. Here's what's going on with the Rosemary Boulevard Project. Here's what's going on with the decisions being made at the city council level. And I don't know, but we, if you've ever, if you've seen our new publication, Connect Temple City, that's a new one. We're trying to be more journalistic and give you the information you want, rather than what we think you need to hear. So we're looking at that. We now have social media in line because we're reaching a new demographic and way of age. We, um, and uh, we're also in the process of moving forward with a new website and also our first academy. This is a way to engage you. The other thing is economic development. Again, I talked earlier about how redevelopment agencies are, are abolished. Cities don't have powers to do anything. But now, <coughs> because we have been smart because the council has allocated about $8 million for economic development projects, we're going to be moving forward and looking at where does this community want to go with new shops, new uh, projects along Las Tunas, Rosemary. And those are discussions we'll be having with you as those initiatives are rolled out. So these are really our two key focuses of this year. Management Services also has the city clerk's office. And um, this is Peggy Quo. She's our acting city clerk. And Peggy, if you could please stand up. Thank you. And Peggy actually is a Temple Cityan, and she lives on Danbury. So I'm just letting you guys know. Um, Peggy, uh, her job is to really safeguard the city's records. She is um, what you'd call like our big safe deposit box or our big vault. She makes sure that all of our city records are maintained. She makes sure that all of our uh, public meetings. Um, have agendas and are properly noticed. She basically keeps us out of the, the she keeps us in line. Um, she keeps us transparent. You're seeing more of a thrust from her department where now we're posting agendas online, audio files, um, webcasts. We're trying to be much more transparent in what we do with uh, our public meetings because those are decisions that are impacting Temple City. And um, the other thing she does is she updates the municipal code. There's a lot of ordinances, which are basically laws, that are getting passed. And so our goal, at least from a communication side, is we're going to let you guys know. But also, she needs to make sure that's in line so we don't get sued. And then finally, she conducts the city election. Again, we don't have elections based on the county's calendar. We have our own. And in fact, she's ramping up for the next city council election in March. So administrative services, uh, this is our new administrative services director. Her name is Tracy House, and unfortunately she couldn't be here tonight. She's actually at an open house event for her son who's going into high school. But uh, she is our new administrative services director, has been here for three months, and she is basically the accountant for the city. And when I say accountant, she's more than accountant. There's a lot of stuff that she deals with. First of all, she pays all the cities in payroll. So um, about $900,000 a month she issues in checks because we have contract checks that we have to pay, we have payroll checks. Um, it's just a lot of work. Just, I mean, if we've all done our bills, it takes me an hour probably to pay my bills. Imagine $900,000 going out every month for that. 
She also invests our $35 million investment portfolio to make sure that we always have some money in the bank. And um, right now, that's challenging because interest rates are low. So she's trying to see how, what's the best yield we can get on return without getting too crazy because we have to stay within the state confines for how we invest our money. She also prepares and monitors the annual budget. In fact, the annual budget is called out in the city charter, and that's coming up June 19th. She also is essentially the city's risk manager, making sure that we don't get sued, that we are compliant with OSHA, which is, um, gosh, I don't even know what that is, but it's OSHA. <laughs> yeah, I think everybody knows that, yeah. And then she, and, and her big thrust these, this year is looking at two critical assets that probably, in my opinion, have been ignored, and that is your people and your technology. Because as residents want more services and want to be much more efficient in how we do that, we need to start making sure that our employees are trained to provide the service levels that Temple Cityans expect. Let's call it for what it is. If you're spending over $500,000 for a new house, you're going to expect top level services, and that's what we want to give you. So we're providing that training. The other thing is information technology. Um, we're looking at where's the information technology change going? Um, should we start looking at um, outsourcing some of our information technology and taking it on the cloud and minimize and, and, and uh, reducing some of our costs? How do we get all of our, our city staff properly trained in even the basics like Microsoft Word? It, it's a tall order, but she's doing a great job in shifting that philosophy so really treating people and technology as real assets. Steve Masura, he's in the back. You'll be hearing from him. He's our community development director, and um, he wears a lot of hats. He's almost like a hat rack uh, because he has probably one of our largest department. Um, he has one of our largest departments here in the city. Um, Steve, you will deal with him and his staff. Um, he reveals all the development proposals. So something again as small as making sure that your room addition is done to the gateway project. And people say, why do I have to go to Steve to, to, to get something simple like a room addition? It's because they have the knowledge to know that your room addition is either going to be good or bad, it's going to be safe. And at the end of the day, we want room additions or any type of improvement on our property to get a higher return on our value. So he's there for that. The other thing that we're really looking at is how do we plan the city's future growth? The last time we had any kind of comprehensive plan for the city was done in 1989. We've had huge demographic shifts. We are becoming an older community of way of construction. We're having more population demand. What is Temple Bend City going to look like in the next 20 to 30 years? So Steve is looking at that. In fact, we're going to be starting our comprehensive plan or general plan update within the next year. Steve is also the guy who uh, manages parking control. Uh, 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 code enforcement, and we call it community preservation. Um, so basically, he's done a really good job in especially revamping the, the property maintenance regulations here in the city. Some people don't like that, but at the end of the day, <coughs> we have huge property investments, five, six hundred thousand dollars We want to make sure that the neighborhood's looks nice. And in fact, if from an economic development standpoint, it makes sense. Our city is 90% residential. That, from, uh, from our standpoint, most of our revenue is property tax. If you have shoddy neighborhoods, it's not going to get their resale value. People are not going to want to live in Temple City. Steve is also, if you think about it, is kind of our superintendent. His staff, uh, they maintain the city buildings and medians. Uh, he also oversees the city's $3 million a year uh, public safety contract with the Sheriff's Department. And he also manages construction projects big and large, or small and big, anything from a, st a street repaving to what we're going to see with Rosemary Boulevard. So that's Steve. And the last person is our party girl, it's Kathy Burroughs. And she's the last person here. And I call her a party girl because she brings fun to the community. Actually, Kathy, if you didn't know, she is on Dane's Drive right here. And she's been a resident since 19... Uh, 77. Okay, 77. So she's been here a while. Um, so basically, Kathy's programs are probably... I'll, I'll be honest, I wouldn't want to do her job. It's, it's, you're dealing with so many moving targets. Because she's got that job where everyone thinks they can do it bigger, brighter, better, smarter. I mean, it's a lot to put on events and recreational programming, but she does a great job. And in fact, we, if you look at our enrollment, we actually get more people coming from out the city, outside the city to enroll in our programs. So she provides recreational planning and programs, 
We have about 800 participants um, every uh, quarter that participate in our programs. Um, she hosts 20 community events a year. Um, really, her business is making memories. Hopefully, they're good memories. And we laugh about that, but people remember their experiences in, in function programs. Um, she also manages the community services, and this is her big focus this year. When we talk about community services, we have a huge aging baby boom population. Um, and we're see, like we talked about 42 years of age. It's because our age is right in the middle. We have a lot of um, youth, and we have a lot of seniors. And so she's having to figure out how do you balance the programming needs or the recreational needs of both those cohort, cohorts. So she's done a great job bringing in dial ride services. She now has a case manager uh, that provides social services to the elderly, and she's also uh, instituted the senior meal program. So she's done a great job on that. On top of it, just when you thought she just did parks, she also maintains uh, the city's parks, meaning making sure that they're green, and also the city's bus shelters, and she also oversees the city's street, pre street tree program, which is about 5,500 trees in the city, so chances are if you've got a tree in front of your house, she's taking care of it for you. So at the end of the day, um, all of our pro projects, tasks, they're all interdepartmental, and I'll give you an example. Roseby Boulevard, and we're going to be talking about that because I know that's on everybody's top of mind, but let's think about the Roseby Boulevard. Council, they're going to say, we want this done. So it trickles down. Okay. So then it goes to the city attorney. The city attorney takes care of the contracts. Then it trickles down to Jose. Jose, or our city manager, I'm sorry, um, drives, the, 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 drives the project. Tracy House, our administrative services director, is going to make sure that the project comes in on budget. Steve is going, to our, city, our community development director, is going to make sure that that project is being managed properly. And Kathy, who works in parks, wants to make sure that um, we're not impeding any kind of services to our seniors who are using the buses. So we all work together. And in fact, with big projects and trying to shift the organization, we all need to communicate. And we're doing a good job communicating. Because when you communicate, you set goals and you're getting stuff done. Um, you know, we're gearing up towards a new uh, organizational level. Before it used to be status quo, I think, and I'll, this is me speaking, I think maybe a lot wasn't done in the past because it's scary to do, do new projects. It's always easier to maintain. But, uh, you know, we're gearing to a high performance. And do I, do I want to say we're a well-oiled machine right now? No, but we're not definitely rusty gears either. We're getting to be that well-oiled machine and we're learning. So with that being said, I'll stop for questions if, if anybody has any. Question. Yes. Question. During uh, last year's, uh, you know, the strong wind disaster, uh, I just want to how, can you just briefly explain how the city departments work together oh, yeah. for emergency response? <laughs> you know, this is the hot topic, and in fact, I'm going right into it, so okay. this is perfect. All right, so trust me, I promise two minutes on one slide, and then we'll get into it. So first, of, so the, the third thing is why the need for intergovernmental cooperation. And it's, it's interesting because my dad actually asked that to me the other day. He was reading the, the paper and where he lives, they were hiring an intergovernmental affairs manager. And he says, why are they paying to hire an intergovernmental affairs manager to go deal with other governments when they should be focusing on what's going on in my own city? And I thought that's actually a good question. But the reality is cities are changing. Their philosophies are changing for how we deliver services. And this is, I'm using this as an analogy, but this is the proverbial island mentality. This is like, you know, Temple City's in the middle of the island, everything's done in autonomy, everything's done in a vacuum, there's no relationship to anybody else. So you're very isolated. Where the reality is we're not an island. We might be a small little city, but we're part of the larger region. We're part of the Southern California, LA region. And in fact, in order to provide a high level service um, to our residents, we have to be better partners. We have to be better team players in the regional approach. So with that being said, we've got, if you were to put Temple City on a table, and then you were to pop on all these different layers of all these boundaries of all these other government agencies, at minimum, we've got 30 other government agencies that we're dealing with. And, like, and I'll give you for an example. Air Quality Management District takes, you know, um, covers us. Water districts cover us. Um, we've 30. How do you manage all that? And some people might say, oh my gosh, it's just more levels of bureaucracy, more government. Ah. But actually, I think you need to look at it a, bit, a little bit differently and say that it really creates a lot of opportunities, which gets into why 
windstorm was so good. Not from that, but for how we responded to it. First of all, why cooperate? It's important because it allows for a continuum of services. We need to engage with other governments. I can, I can give you an example where just by meeting with the, the library, it's a county agency, it's not a city agency, but we know what's going on over there with story time activities, what's going on with their clothes, and what that does is that's an extension of the services we can communicate to the community of what they can enjoy. The other, um, and, and uh, with that, creates, it creates vehicles for funding. Well, you know, let me, let me go back to this real quick because I, I do want to address it here. It's going to address these two things. But let's talk about the windstorm. The windstorm, we're 35 people, that's it. And we've had, the city was in shambles. But because, first of all, we're a contract city, we were able to outsource the, the, the services. So we had people here night and day getting us to be one of the cities that was cleaned up within, what, seven? I don't know, Kathy, what do you think? Uh, Steve? We were looking at the streets within four days, I think. Four days, we, we had things cleaned up. Where um, I know other cities north of us named, well, we won't name, we're still, had, still had to bring in January. So the, the why cooperate is because first of all, we have good relationships with County Fire. And I don't know, if, if Jose, if you wanted to maybe elaborate on this a little bit more because I, I, I don't want to do it wrong. I think you can really explain why intergovernmental relations is so important, especially in the case of the county. 